You know, many of us can summarize a movie if you let us ramble on and on about it. But let's say, how do you summarize a movie in 25 words or less? So I'm going to give you a short summary of a movie, and we'll see if you know what the movie is. I think there's about eight of these I'm going to do. If you get all eight, I want to know that. I don't think anybody's going to get all eight. All right? Don't blurt it out. I'm, you're on the honor system today, okay? So just be honest. All right. First movie. After the death of her parents, a young socialite causes millions in property damage. A lot of you have seen this. The movie is Frozen. All right. Second movie. This movie is real simple. A dad has to go pick up his daughter. The movie is Taken. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. All right. Third movie. Immigrant adoptee is repatriated to country of birth, experiences culture shock and prejudice. I know many of you have seen this. The movie is Elf. Remember that? All right, this one I think most of you are going to get. Bullied kid solves all of his problems and gets a girlfriend by learning how to kick people in the face. Karate Kid, yeah. All right, this one you might have to think about. A brave mother and father rescue their kidnapped children from a serial killer who wears her victim's skins. What type of parent would let their kid watch this movie? The movie is 101 Dalmatians. Think about it. All right, this one I'm guessing most of you have seen. A guy learns to love a girl without her Instagram filters. That would be Shrek. All right, this one I would guess most of you will get. A young girl talks to furniture and marries her kidnapper. Beauty and the Beast. And then the last one. Transported to a dreamlike landscape, a young girl kills the first person she meets and then teams up with three strangers to kill again. That would be the Wizard of Oz. Think about it. You kill the first witch, then you go after the next witch. All right. So it's one thing. Did anybody get all eight, by the way? Okay. You created it. All right. You get a treat, a special treat, a pen from a hotel. There you go. <laughs> All right. It's one thing to try to summarize a movie in just a few words, but how do you summarize the gospel message in just a few words? Have you ever thought about that? How do you summarize the gospel message in just a few words? As Christians, we believe the gospel message, and we want to share the gospel message with others. But how do you share it in just a few words so that you don't ramble on and on? You want to make it concise so that people can understand it. This past week, I ran across a summary of the gospel message that I really, really like. I want to share that with you this morning. The man who came up with this summary, is, uh, his name is Dick Foth, and this is what he said. He summarized the gospel this way. He said, he came to our place, he took our place, and he invites us back to his place. That is the gospel in a nutshell. And I love that summary of the gospel. He came to our place, he took our place, and he invites us back to his place. And I want us to unpack each of those phrases this morning. First, he came to our place. Isn't that what we celebrate at Christmas? Jesus was willing to humble himself and become a human. Matthew described it this way. This was how Jesus, God's anointed one, was born. His mother Mary had promised Joseph to be his wife, but while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Her fiancé, Joseph, was a righteous man, full of integrity, and he didn't want to disgrace her. But when he learned of her pregnancy, he secretly planned to break off the engagement. While he was still debating with himself about what to do, he fell asleep and had a supernatural dream. 
An angel from the Lord appeared to him in clear light and said, Joseph, descendant of David, don't hesitate to take Mary into your home as your wife because the power of the Holy Spirit has conceived a child in her womb. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Savior, for he is destined to give his life to save his people from their sins. This happened so that what the Lord spoke through his prophet would come true. Listen, a virgin will be pregnant, she will give birth to a son, and he will be known as Emmanuel, which means in Hebrew, God is with us. When Joseph awoke from his dream, he did all that the angel of the Lord instructed him to do. He took Mary to be his wife, but they refrained from having sex until she gave birth to her son, whom they named Jesus. So when you think of Jesus coming to our place, what exactly does that mean for him to come to our place? I think it's the ultimate example of downsizing. You'll hear some parents talk about downsizing. Once the kids move out of the house, they decide they need a smaller house since they don't need all of that space anymore. When you think of what Jesus left to come to this earth, it really is the ultimate example of downsizing. With the birth of Jesus, God put skin on He became touchable and approachable. We need to kind of picture this in our mind. God is all-powerful, and yet he downsized to the confines of a human womb. God became a helpless baby who had to be fed and nursed and burped. He humbled himself and became nothing so that we could become something. The Apostle Paul described it like this in Philippians 2. He said, think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but he didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. And having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life. And then he died a selfless obedience death, and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. And because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. That's downsizing. Think of what he left to come here, to come to our place. The second part of the gospel summary is this. He took our place. And with this step, we move from the cradle to the cross. No gospel summary is complete without the cross. William Shakespeare said, He jests at scars who never felt a wound. We don't serve a scarless God. We serve a God who knows all about scars. We serve a God with scarred hands and scarred feet and scarred side and scarred back. Isaiah tells us that Jesus was scarred beyond recognition. Isaiah 52 says, Many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. So why would God go through this suffering and allow himself to be scarred like that? Jesus went through that terrible suffering on the cross so he could take your place and take my place. He took the punishment we deserved, And he did it because of love. In 2 Corinthians 5 it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And with this verse, Jesus is making a deal that we can't refuse. He says, give me all of your sin and I'll give you all of my righteousness and we'll call it even. Do you like that deal? Is that a deal you want to accept today? Jesus says, give me all of your sin, I'll give you all of my righteousness, and we'll call it even. And then the third part of the gospel summary is this. He invites us back to his place. 
And when I thought about this third part of the summary, the scripture that came to my mind was Jesus when he was speaking in John 14. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And then listen to that same scripture from the message. Don't let this throw you. You trust God, don't you? Trust me. There's plenty of room for you in my father's home. If that weren't so, would I have told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so you can live where I live. I think that's a cool picture that you want to hold on to. Jesus says there's more than enough room in my father's home, so don't worry that we're going to run out of room. I'm getting a place ready for you right now, and when the time is right, I'm going to come back and get you, and then we will be together forever. I don't know about you, but I find tremendous comfort in that verse. That verse brings me comfort today, and it especially brings me comfort when I lose a loved one. I need to know that we're going to be together with Jesus forever with our loved ones. In verse 3, Jesus said, When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. So just think of that. We get to be in the presence of Jesus for all of eternity. And that promise isn't just for us. It's for everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. So we see a very similar picture in Revelation 21. That scripture says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So I don't know about you, but when God invites us back to his place, I want to go there. Because there will be no more death or crying or pain. I hope you realize one of the greatest gifts that God gives to you is the gift of his presence. It's the gift of his presence. Jesus said, I will be with you always to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit is our 24-7 counselor. He's with us 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. He's always on call. Before you got up this morning and after you go to bed tonight, he will be interceding for you. You know, at Christmas time, we often focus on the word Emmanuel, which means God with us. And as we think about God being with us, I think we often see this from our perspective and what it means to us. God will be with us no matter what trial we face in life. God will never leave us or forsake us. He will be there to comfort us and give us strength. Those are some promises we need to hold on to. But when we hear the name Emmanuel, do we ever think of that from God's perspective? One writer put it this way. He said, maybe this is stating the obvious, but the Almighty One became God with us because He wanted to be with us. God wants to spend eternity with you. You know, even I get tired of being around me sometimes. <laughs> but God doesn't get tired of me. God loves you and He loves me and He wants to spend eternity with us. The best experiences are lacking if we experience it only by ourselves. And the greatest experiences we have in life are shared together experiences. I want you to use your imagination. Picture me on the golf course. On a short par three, I hit a beautiful shot and get a hole in one. That's why you use your imagination. <laughs> if I hit a hole in one and I'm all by myself, who do I get to celebrate with? And who would believe me anyway? You know, I need some people there to celebrate with. The greatest experiences we have are shared experiences. Several months ago, my wife and I went to a movie at the Riverview Theater in Minneapolis. That's an older theater, and during the summer they were showing some popular movies from the past. One of our favorite movies is The Princess Bride, so we decided to go to that movie. We'd been to several movies at that theater, and usually it's less than half full. But on that night for The Princess Bride, that theater was over 90% full. And as we sat there waiting for the movie to start, the audience was full of anticipation. You could tell they knew this movie extremely well. 
Before the movie started, some of the people would start yelling out some of their favorite lines from the movie. <laughs> this was the most engaged movie audience I'd ever been with. There was a sense of community in that theater because everyone admired that movie so, so much. They had it memorized. When the movie was over, everyone stood and clapped. And as I thought about that movie experience, I realized I wouldn't have enjoyed that night nearly as much if I had just gone there by myself. It was better because I was there with Louise. And I didn't go to that theater expecting a sense of community that night, but it happened. And it made me think about our church community. The people in the movie theater that night loved that movie, and they couldn't wait to share in the experience of that movie with others. You know, they could have just stayed home and watched the movie by themselves on a DVD, but it wouldn't have been the same. As Christians, we love our God, and we can't wait to praise Him with other believers. You know, you can't just stay home and praise God by yourself, but there's real value when the church comes together to praise God and celebrate the Lord's Supper. God designed us so that we need the sense of community. We need brothers and sisters in Christ. God longs to be with us. We long to be with Him. There's a value in the community of Jesus Christ. Our worship is at its best when people come with their hearts prepared, eager to worship the great God we serve. You can just tell the difference it makes when you're with brothers and sisters in Christ who are eager to worship our God. How many of you remember a mining disaster that happened in 2010 in Chile where 33 miners were trapped? Anybody remember that story? Yeah, Hector Tobar wrote a book called Deep Down Dark where he tells the story of the 33 miners who were trapped 2,000 feet below the surface for 69 days. Picture yourself in that setting. Total darkness. 69 days. They had to live in the dark with very little food, cut off from the rest of the world. They didn't know if they would ever see daylight again. Many of the miners who were now face to face with imminent death decided to take stock of their lives. And they realized they had a lot of regrets. Jose Enriquez was a Christian, and they asked him if he would pray for everyone. So as he got down on his knees, some of the other men joined him, and Jose began to talk to God. He said, we aren't the best men, Lord, but please have pity on us. And then he got more specific. He said, Victor Segovia, he knows he drinks too much. And Victor Zamora, he's too quick to anger. And Pedro Cortez thinks about the poor father that he's been to his young daughter. And nobody objected to him praying like that. It was the beginning of something special. In the deep down dark, buried under the earth, with death staring them in the face, these men got real before God, and they got real with each other. They met every day to eat a small meal, hear a short sermon, and then get on their knees to pray. And some would pray, God, forgive me for the violence of my voice before my wife and my son. Or God, forgive me for abusing the temple of my body with drugs. They confessed to each other, too. One person said, I'm sorry I raised my voice. Another person said, I'm sorry I didn't, get, I didn't help get the water. Meanwhile, above the surface, a rescue effort had begun. People from all over the world began trying to help or give or pray for the men to be saved. And unfortunately, the happiest part of the story is also the saddest part of the story. The drill cuts a narrow hole through the rock. The miners get food and supplies and iPads, and they know that they're eventually going to be rescued. And they find out that they're becoming famous, and they realize that they might get rich. And then do you know what happens? The confessing stops, and the praying stops. The lure of money and fame undoes this beautiful community that they had developed when they were staring death in the face. They were at their best when life was at its worst. The deep down dark is a place where you know you can't make it on your own. The deep down dark is a place where you realize that you need God. 
And really, I hope that's what we have in common today. I hope you come here every Sunday realizing that deep down you need God. That should be our starting point. We start with our brokenness. We need God. And we move from there. So as we end this message, I hope you'll realize how much you need God. We looked at the gospel message. He came to our place. He took our place. And he invites us back to his place. And that gospel message has an invitation that we all need to respond to. Jesus made it clear there is a heaven and there is a hell. And he made it clear that not everyone will go to heaven. Everyone must respond to his invitation. So what is your response? In Acts 2, Peter preached a gospel message summary to the people. And after hearing the message, the people wanted to know how they should respond if they wanted to be saved. And in Acts 2.38, Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we then learned that about 3,000 people became followers of Jesus that day and were baptized. We have an amazing God to celebrate as we close this service. Jesus came to our place. He took our place. He invites us back to his place. Make sure you accept his invitation today. If you're ready to accept his invitation, I'll be glad to meet with you and pray with you. Today might be a busy day for a lot of people. Maybe you have a lot of things planned today. But you know, we should never be too busy to accept God's invitation. If God's tugging at your heart today, don't ignore him. Accept his invitation. We need God. He's invited us. We need to respond. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray for all of us here today that we'll come to you in our brokenness and realize how much we need you. I thank you, Lord. I praise you that you were willing to come to this earth. I thank you that you were willing to take our place. And I praise you for the invitation we have to spend eternity with you. And if you're moving today in someone's heart and they need to respond to you, I pray that they'll have the courage to do that. We celebrate you, Lord. You're an amazing God. We thank you for the hope we have in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.